Welcome back to the Peace Offering Podcast. And today's really exciting interview is with Stuart Lundy. Stuart is incredible. He is the owner of Perennial Roots Farm in Virginia, where he has been raising ducks, geese, rabbits, turkeys, chickens, sheep, hogs on 50 acres. He has a small garden market, a CSA, a, a young orchard. He also is the creative director at the Josephine Porter Institute, which is the only organization in the United States that makes Rudolf Steiner's biodynamic preparations and sells them. It's really, really cool. He is like the knowledge head of the the biodynamic system, with especially with regard to these inoculations that they call them. And so we're going to be digging into Steiner's uh, philosophy on farming, uh, the metaphysics of farming, which is just, wow, mind-blowing, as well as what these preparations are meant to do. He's a real renaissance man that is uh, waking up first thing in the morning and farming. And when he's done with farming, he's writing on his sub stack, which uh, you should definitely check out. We'll put that in the link. But uh Here's Stuart Lundy. Hope you enjoy it. Yep. Well, thank you, Stuart, for uh, speaking with us. I'm very excited. And I know you're busy. I, you know, just looking at, gosh, your sub stack and your Instagram and your farm. And, you know, that's probably only the half of it, I imagine. And all the conferences that you're attending. Thanks for taking your time. Um, it, can you just uh, give the listeners sort of an introduction to Stuart Lundy and what you're up to in the in the in the farming world and the introduction to that yeah um i mean i'm a cross section of a lot of things but we began farming in 2010 and the idea was to kind of grow our own food i like good food i also don't like doctor's bills so it seemed like i could address two of those things by also not having a boss and <laughs> working for myself turns out that's a lot more work than i imagined because nature is a very exacting boss, um, but there's no one to blame if I mess it up, but because nature just responds. If I give garbage to the garden, I get garbage back. So it's uh, it's taught me a lot, but we've got cattle, we've got sheep, we've got hogs, we've got a market garden, um, small orchard. We do herbs, we do markets, like I said, and uh, we've done a CSA in the past, not this year, but we have, and a little bit of everything on our farm um then at the josephine porter institute i'm currently the creative director there where i help uh, ben nome who's our farm manager and preparation maker as well as the board help oversee preparation quality and what does that mean what's a preparation well a preparation in the biodynamic world are special herbal remedies that are composted in special ways in order to provide things that tend to run out in the soil and in compost. And we are the leading producer of these special remedies in North America, and we send them across the world. Okay, so um, thank you for that. Give give listeners and viewers a, an introduction to what biodynamic farming is, where it comes from. <laughs> Um, and, and kind of is this macro high level view of what it is. Sure. Well, biodynamics is an attempt brought to the world by Rudolf Steiner. And there's a way to distinguish it from traditional modes of wisdom. And it's not to say that two or one is better than the other, but rather over time of tending soil in the same place, with the mechanization of labor, with the introduction of synthetic fertilizers, we ended up destroying certain things in the soil. And we lost kind of intuitive connection that we used to have with the earth. We as individuals became more atomized. And as part of that process, we began to feel the earth itself was a fleck of dust floating in space, not contextualized by meaning, um, no longer framed by a beautifully structured cosmos, but a piece of dust flying through a void. And Steiner's attempt is to help weave humanity back into the whole. And part of that 
comes down to nutrition. So he offers very specific ways to help basically repair the connection between the earth and the cosmos with special remedies. And none of these supersede, um, like I said, traditional wisdom or an intimate relationship with a particular land. These are medicines from the cosmos, you could say, which are meant to meet the real world conditions and just be added to them. But it's a medicine, a cosmic medicine to help overcome fragmentation, isolation, and disintegration of modern culture. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that uh, Rudolf Steiner is a is one of these like super enigmatic figures um, because he his it, it, I mean that guy was tapping into something. He was definitely yeah. channeling something. But you know, for those that don't know, he's enigmatic because he. Um, well, not only did he create biodynamic farming, but also sort of the medical system that is that is a lateral uh, branch to that anthroposophy and also the Waldorf school system. It yep. was just the breadth of his work and how prolific he was. Wasn't he the most prolific writer of his time? Something like 50 pages a day. Uh, that, well, that yeah, <laughs> he's uh, a most of what he wrote um, were hit lectures so these are things people wrote down from what he delivered um but if you put all that together it is an it's an insane amount of work and the topics that he covers <laughs> are topics many people wouldn't have even begun to entertain much less have something to say about it's the scope of his work is prolific it really is so, so to understand biodynamic farming from his view and from with from from your view, I'm assuming it, it, it's this is a physical and a metaphysical pursuit. It's a physical and a metaphysical nutritional uh, eating system. So you're feeding multiple dimensions of your being, and you're reconnecting multiple dimensions of your being to this overarching uh, cosmology that you were just talking about. Absolutely. It's a way of restoring, it's a spiritual form of agriculture, a metaphysical one, but one that aims at like concrete human nutrition. Like it tastes better, it looks better, it stores better. You feel better when you eat it. Like these are concrete things that we can each experience. But Steiner brought this about because he felt some of the uh, other methods just didn't seem to be taking effect the way he wanted. He'd hoped that Certain spiritual exercises would have provided results. Certain economic endeavors that he invested in would have borne fruit. But he came down to believing that it's now there's something else that's jamming the system up at a more basic level. And he said it's a problem of nutrition. Because if we don't have the basic building blocks, the basic forces necessary to thrive as a living human being, it's really hard to build on a weak foundation. So for Steiner, he went back to basics. He's like, no, no, no. The soil has become so depleted that um, grain isn't worth what it was. Food doesn't taste the way it did. We're getting declining nutritional value. And how do we restore that so that the earth as the field of human activity can be sustained and not just go extinct? I, I love this concept. I've really been pursuing this, um, you know, outside by dynamic farming, but what um, two things what, I would like at some point, you know, um, for you to explain wh what he saw as the missing nutritional components for he, what was happening. But is it is it safe to say that from this perspective, you cannot um, fully incarnate, you cannot fully bring sort of your spirit into this domain if your physical body is not fed these nutritional components. In other words, there's some kind of bottom up and top down integration that needs to happen. Yes, and I, I think that's generally true. It's It's going to be much harder to integrate spiritual life with inadequate nutrition because the, the the basis upon which we live this physical existence if that's compromised it makes it harder it doesn't make it impossible because there are things that we can overcome through our own inner work inner experience but 
if we have what is needed and we're eating plants that are healthy, it makes it a lot easier for us to then be healthy. I like to give an example of um, you can eat all the corn you want. It doesn't make you corny, but if you eat healthy corn, it has a tendency to make you healthy. And the problem these days has been we're, we're eating crops that require so many artificial props to keep them alive and get them to fruition. Why on earth could we expect to eat them and be any better? We're going to need artificial props to keep us limping along because we ate something that doesn't actually possess the inner vitality to grow, thrive, reproduce, and continue. We want those things that have those qualities of vibrant health. So when we eat them, we get them. And the decline for Steiner has come to that more materialistic mindset of it's just molecules, it's just atoms. And if you get the right amount of these dead substances, somehow you get health out of that. And Steiner was like, no, it's a bit more nuanced than that. You want something that has these more subtle capacities, the ability to grow, thrive, reproduce. And from that, you can gain health. But it's not just about an exhaustive list of macro and micronutrients. Those are important. But for Steiner, it was more the activity there, the quality of health, what he calls forces. And that's a little more subtle. And for some of us, it's hard to imagine that invisible world. But for me, the, I like to start people with, we all know there's good gut bacteria now. There's, and that's mostly invisible to us. Well, there's good gut bacteria for the soil and their activities, the behavior of these, we'll call that forces. How they behave and the tendencies and how lactobacillin makes, you know, milk into yogurt, that process we need alive in the soil. And what Steiner's talking about isn't just microbes, but it's like almost just behind microbes. It's just these governing tendencies, like a stimulant, or when you add yeast to make bread. The soil had become depleted of these governing principles, these influences that would guide fermentation, guide digestion, help build soil. And those had become exhausted by you know, misuse, overtilling, and the uh, application of the wrong kind of fertilizers. But his impulse was to try to restore these things. So as a consequence, the right bacteria, the right fungi would then thrive as a consequence. Got it. So um, th that's really interesting. What, what did he call these forces that were behind the microbiome of the soil? Did he have a name for it? And, and um, as a follow to that, is there some relationship between those forces and the cosmos as you were sort of initially laying out? So Steiner refers to these as life forces, or more generally, he classifies them as terms of the like etheric formative forces. This is what is really at work. If you imagine every plant as a sort of hologram, something kind of bursting into existence there's some sort of energetic template and if that's not there the plant isn't going to become who it is as well as it should and it's about helping restore these forces and i almost think of it like a battery that the soil has an energetic store of energy and we need to replenish that because every plant you know feeds off of that and as it's feeding off of that it's actually discharging the energy it's returning to the cosmos and if the the battery is depleted the plants just don't grow as well and it's about returning those life forces that ongoing process of what to our external eye looks like constant decomposition so humus organic matter as these things decompose they liberate energy which then plants and microbes can use in the biodynamic view you can present a dilemma is the compost pile alive because it's full of microbes or does it become full of microbes because it's full of you know food and full of vitality those are the life forces that we're trying to restore to the soil is really you could imagine almost a prebiotic, not a probiotic, 
not the microbes, but the foods that would feed the right kinds of microbes. So it's that kind of step back and we're getting there in terms of modern science, but biodynamics was feeling through it in its own vocabulary. And yeah, wow, that correspondence. So cool. yeah, yeah, that correspondence was between the cosmos and the earth is that the thing, very things that basically caused each planet to condense at a particular ring rather than somewhere else. There are still activities and harmonics of that working down here. So Steiner's impulse was to basically help draw those in, things that normally would take eons to accumulate in the soil and to do so with these special tuned frequency remedies, so to speak. Okay, so that that those remedies or preparations or inoculations, that's what you at Josephine Porter Institute, you specialize in those. Correct. I mean, that sounds yeah. <laughs> that sounds like so, like that sounds like you're doing some like covert white magic there, you know, to uh to change to change these uh change these sort of metaphysical forces. That is actually pretty much exactly what it is. Um, there was someone who even challenged Steiner on some of it because they were like, this sounds like you're straying into magic. Well, what is it black magic? Is it hmm, what is this? And he said, finally, Steiner replied to the guy and said, look, anything can be black magic if you're misusing it. <laughs> it's like, it depends on your intention. What are you guiding these things toward? These are for human nutrition, the sake of human freedom, and for healing the earth. So these are those are pretty noble goals. and But that's what this is. It's about restoring these subtle forces that allow the human spiritual organism to express itself freely and to be less burdened down by merely physical existence. And if we want, for example, like a lively inner imagination, we need to be taking in lively things, whether it's, you know, inspiring ideas from books or you know, healthy plants. If we eat dead, tired food, well, that's going to have a psycho spiritual effect on me. So it's important what our diet is, both spiritually speaking, but also physically. And people tend to go to one or the other. They'll just absorb spiritual texts and have spiritual exercises. And maybe the food part gets completely ignored, or they'll just focus on, I'm going to have my multivitamin and my physical regimen and forget that other counterpart. But the two are really meant to meet in the middle for the fullness of the thriving human being. Okay. Um, so these, uh, I mean, when you, when you're talking about this, it makes me think a little bit about alchemy. I'm, I'm sure that has some it, that was informing Steiner at some level. You know, for for example, um, uh, the planets of Venus and Mars and having an influence in sort of uh, maybe feminine masculine dynamics and and things like this. Sure. And uh, which which we have covered in the past uh, for viewers that want to check that out you can go look at uh, some of the interviews with Lincoln Gergar and um, so I'd like to know where does the mineral kingdom fit into this uh, paradigm that you're presenting here that there is, there there is the liberation of this sort of vital essence um, I, I'm assuming he called that etheric energy that is happening yeah. um, through humus and happening through this decompositional process, which is then feeding microbes, which then is having uh, having sort of a downstream effect on the plants, which would then have a downstream effect on the animals that ate the plants, would have yep. a downstream effect on the humans that are eating that. So uh, it, there is this continuity from this initial process of, of inoculating the soil with these things all the way through every organism that would consume part of that where does the mineral kingdom fit into this and how, how what is the role sure um steiner was focusing not on like erasing progress of science but just opposing only things that just seem to be gumming up the works and not allowing human flourishing so for the mineral kingdom Steiner is specifically drawing on plants that perform a role that's analogous to 
what an agricultural input would be. For example, you get chamomile, and Steiner talks about it as having this natural relationship between sulfur and calcium. Now, if you were to put sulfur and calcium together out in the world of agricultural inputs, you'd have something like gypsum, which is a common agricultural input. What Steiner's trying to do is find a form of gypsum that's already in a plant form. So that means it is bioavailable, it's, in a, it's linked up with carbon, and it is easily assimilated to a new plant. Because when you consider how little mineral substance each plant actually needs, it's less than 5%, even of some of the richest ones that you might grow in your garden. So that's not a lot. It's mostly air, and it's mostly water, and the energy that's able to combine those. Like, the mineral is important. Like, it's an anchor to the physical world. But what Steiner's trying to nudge us towards is to remain what he calls within the realm of the living. So to draw on plants that already perform a gypsum-like role, but as a whole plant, and then to use that to become this gentle stimulant, because once something is in the realm of the living, it's got, you need far less of it to assimilate it. So that's why we're able to use such small amounts of these plants is these plants are actually agricultural inputs that are properly digested as what you could call plant food. And the plant needs so very little that once you jumpstart that gypsum process and the plant kind of gets it, you don't need a lot more. Now, Steiner talks about how the air itself has all of the minerals we need. And this is a curious idea, but if you follow it to its proper conclusion, what Steiner is saying is if you can get a plant to be vital enough and healthy enough, and you're not overfeeding it from the mineral world, it develops the ability to breathe in what it needs from the cosmos itself, from the air around it. Now, if you're overfeeding, and this there's a, an analogy here to human nutrition, if we're overfed of certain things, and maybe we have too many of these minerals, um, that blocks that natural capacity to inhale from the cosmos. And it doesn't, this doesn't to say that we shouldn't do any supplementation at all, but rather that the vitality of what we eat enables that kind of breathing from the air around us and for plants and for humans. So that's what Steiner's trying to restore. And that can really only be done in his view in agriculture is if we slowly wean the farm away from synthetic mineral fertilizers and allow that to kind of be something the plant attracts to itself out of its own vitality. Would, would you be able to walk us through some of these other preparations and the yep. plants and the minerals that they are calling in? Sure. So the foundational preparation is what's called a horn manure. And many of you seen horns on a cow and often the horns are cut off because the farmer is worried about someone getting injured or another animal being injured. But these horns aren't primarily weapons. The horn of a cow is actually an extension of her sinus cavity. It is part of how she smells. So if you were to remove that, you're removing a huge amount of her capacity for smelling. And most of what a cow does is breathe in, smell, and send signals down to her gut. Because in her gut, she has more neurons than in her brain. So she does her thinking in her gut. If, if you lobotomize a cow's sense of smell, it corrupts the whole process of digestion, which is unfortunate. But we take that horn, the outer sheath, which is made of the same stuff as your nails and your hair, of keratin, and we stuff that with cow manure. Now, cow manure smells bad, or just rather it stinks to begin with. Paracelsus refers to that as the power of manure. It is in its stink. But we take that and we bury the horn filled with manure over winter, and by the time we dig that back up, there's no more odor. And what we're doing by putting it into this is almost asking it to learn to smell inwardly the same way that a cow, by smelling her cud, directs an impulse into the ground, into her gut. We want our soil to behave the same way that a cow does. 
So we take that foundational preparation and that's the one we use to basically recharge the soil of that lost potential energy, recharge the battery of the soil. Because if you put a plant into just dead soil, it, it does not do well. Even if it has all the minerals it needs, it's not gonna thrive the way it would if you have an enlivened soil full of life. So that's the first one. The next one we move to is the silica preparation. And so I think of the horn manure as restoring the energy in the soil, the primordial chaos out of which things can then be formed. The crystal, and this gets a little esoteric, but for Steiner, crystals are almost um, a spiritual forerunner of plants. And this doesn't mean that crystals got together and reproduced and one day you got plants evolving out of crystals. He doesn't mean that. What he means is when chemical conditions on earth were totally different, um, carbon life form was impossible. It was too hot. Everything would just burn. Back then, there was a time when quartz and glass itself was molten. So you can imagine quartz crystals growing up the way we get grass growing and then disintegrating and growing and disintegrating. But the whole earth couldn't make plants, but the closest it could get back in the day was quartz crystals growing seasonally out of the face of a molten earth. And as such, Steiner draws on that crystal as this kind of transition out of that primordial chaos of the soup of existence, moving into crystallized form, and then the rest become plant-based. But that that's how I see those foundational ones. One is restoring that darkness of the earth and the other is the lightning movement into crystallized form and that contrast is kind of this back and forth of day and night sun and moon male and female like you mentioned and it's reactivating that process so then the plant can reach its fullest expression and i could continue but those are the two foundational ones okay yeah um it's so interesting that silica plays that role. It, are you using the actual mineral for that? You're, you're using horsetail or, um, or some plant that is uh, sort of aligned with that mineral. Yes. Yeah. And in terms of the biodynamic preparations, we actually take quartz crystals. We grind them up. We make like a really fine flour. We stuff that in a horn and we bury that over summer rather than winter. So we get the winter effect, the summer the female, the male. And what we do by, by that process is it creates soluble silicic acid. So it's a plant available form of silica, which helps plants crystallize into their form. If you've ever looked out and you'll see like the shininess on leaves or a shininess on grass in the winter, what we're really seeing is the effect of silica that's at work in these plants. And we're trying to restore that. But Equisetum or horsetail is a wonderful prophylactic against fungus, mildew, other problems that you might have. Um, and it belongs with the quartz preparation because uh, horsetail is about as close as you can get to a crystal while still being a plant. And so there's a, there's a deep inner relationship between those two because it is it is such an unusual plant. But it's that's one of the most wonderful remedies we have for fighting off fungus and mildew in the garden. Mm, wow. Okay. You know, when you were talking, to, so, so when you're talking about the, the horns of, of, a, of a cow getting cut off, uh, does that mean that if you had grazing cows with horns that were, you were maybe moving across land that you would end up using that that preparation would not be needed? Um, it's a good thought. I think if you're doing proper rotational grazing, you're already most of the way there. I mean, biodynamics is, is not meant, as Steiner gave it to us, it's not meant as a complete system. It's meant as cosmic medicine for a sick earth. And it is not in and of itself a complete system. It's meant to supplement anything that's already working. So good rotational grazing you might not need as much. That's true because you have that ruminating presence. And if you've got healthy cows and dung beetles burying the manure for you, well, you may need even less. But a lot of what 
this the horn manure was designed for use for was for uh, crop fields and for gardens. So you could use it on your pasture, but Steiner was specifically talking in terms of grain production and crops in terms of yield. Well, it's often easier to spray a small amount of transformed good colloidal humus that used to be manure. It's easier to spray that than to bring all your animals into your garden or through your field. So um, this is a way to kind of get that ruminant impulse out over a much larger area where practically you couldn't move all your animals. So the answer is yes and no. If you have the cows already grazing there, there's a significant benefit already. Yeah, I, I like Texas Longhorns, but I like them even more now after hearing that explanation yeah. of the... <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that would that was two of, of how many preparations? Well, depending on how you count them. Some people say it's eight. Some people say it's nine. We can go with the bigger number, but there are nine remedies that Steiner lists. And whether we count equisetum as its own preparation or not is a whole other issue. But Steiner moves through a set, which are generally called the compost preparation set. And this includes yarrow, Achillea millifolium, which is stuffed into a stag splatter. That stag bladder is hanged over summer in the sun, Imagine like how a uh, fruit ripens on a tree. It needs to hang in the sun. And then through that ripening process, it becomes something new. Well, once the summer has ended, you take that sort of yarrow fruit, <laughs> so to speak. It's not a fruit, but you imagine it. And then you take that and you bury it in the ground over winter. So this is almost a full year process. And by the end, the contents are totally transformed and you should hopefully not see any of the original flower anymore. It's just disintegrated. Now, what's the point of that? Well, you want all of the structural form to have gone away, but what remains is all of the forces. So you can imagine all the enzymes, all the hormones, all the essential oils, everything that yarrow would do as a medicinal herb, that's just there in concentrate but now no longer tied up to some structure. It's now pure quality rather than substance. I mean, there's, there's a physicality to the clump of brown material you have, but it's no longer the structured form of a flower or a plant. None of the lattice work of the carbon. It's that has disintegrated and you've taken it and reduced it to pure quality. That then can be distributed into a compost pile and you can treat with a mere tablespoon, a compost pile as big as 10 tons. Okay. Wow. It's a lot. It, it's almost, uh, there's almost, uh, when you're describing that process, makes me think of homeopathic medicine. And, mm -hmm. and um, do you see that there's a relationship there? I mean, because when you're, when you're administering a homeopathic, it's, you know, you're not administering any of the structure or really any measurable thing to a person when they're getting it they're kind of getting the this essence really of, yep. of that thing and i th think it comes close to that because steiner does talk about how you could dilute it and what he describes is you would stir it for an hour and you could then dilute it to another level by stirring for another hour and a larger amount well that's the process of dilution now the amounts we're using definitely seem nearly homeopathic. It's not, strictly speaking, a homeopathic dilution to the point where there's no physical molecular stuff, substance left. But it's not a lot in terms of what we think of applying as agricultural inputs. Generally, we would apply tons, like physical tons, thousands of pounds of a substance to our farms in order to get just a small effect that may only last for a few years. What Steiner's suggesting, though, is taking something that would perform a similar activity, but in a plant, and rendering that so you need almost nothing. That then can radiate through the compost pile and then through the soil, and you need very little. So it is, it's nearly homeopathic in the sense of how little you're using, but if we think of how 
let's say I take, let's say I have a, a cup of tea. There aren't a lot of leaves in here, and yet I can get an experiential uh, result from only a few leaves. If you compare, say, the weight of those leaves to my body, they don't weigh much at all. And that's about the ratio of the preparations we're adding to a 10 ton compost pile. It's what a leaf or two of an herbal tea is to my body. So we're, we're getting just to that edge of what could be considered homeopathic. And yet it's something we use many of us every day and definitely notice a stimulating effect from these herbs. So this is about restoring those. And it does, it gets into that. You know, the reason for such small doses of weeds that you can find on almost any farm is that Steiner is trying to show how a farm from its own resources can create its own fertility instead of relying on the expensive inputs of buying in more phosphorus, buying in more nitrogen, depending on agrochemicals. Well, that's the part that was depleting things, depleting the value of foods during his time. So it's about how can we make that? So these aren't these aren't designed to be obscure or weird. Imagine a peasant farmer who maybe doesn't even read at the time when Steiner's giving this. They need to be able to create fertility from scraps on the farm. So he says, here are some weeds. Um, here's some leftover bits from your cows. Uh, use those to create medicines. And they could have been something else conceivably, but I think Steiner selected these because they belong to making a farm a more self-sufficient and therefore profitable organism. Okay, um, what's another remedy? Another one goes into uh, chamomile and chamomile is taken, it's stuffed into a cow intestine and you make links like sausage. And these diners said you could also hang almost that dry aging process and then you bury them over winter. Now, Steiner says that helps with problems of like basically indigestion in the compost pilots. So it helps prevent gassing off. Now, I found an old herbal remedies by W.T. Fernie. It's early 20th century. And in it, there's a remedy for flatulence in human beings, which is you take cow intestines and you boil it together with chamomile and you drink that and it settles your stomach. So if you have a compost pile, that's getting too active and it's gonna gas off and you wanna retain the aromas. Chamomile is a remedy to help settle that stomach. So you lose less volume of your compost pile, you retain more nitrogen. And that's really what all of these preparations are designed to do is stabilize, retain nitrogen in a way that you're not gonna to have to buy in any more nitrogen. So that's chamomile. And I like to look for precedent, not that Steiner necessarily was inspired by these, but to show that he didn't just pull it out of thin air. There, there is some precedent for some of these images and these herbs, even the herbs and the animal sheath being used together. But that, those are the foundational ones. We then move into nettle. Nettle is the only one of the compost prep that does not require in the original recipe any kind of animal membrane to enclose it. That one, Steiner says to just get as much as you can, stuff it into a hole in the ground, pack it with peat, and then dig it up in a year. So 12 months later, I find it works better buried in a terracotta vessel because then the worms don't get into it. Worms love it, but I don't, <laughs> I want to keep it. I want to be able to use it in my compost and spread the effect. The worms will spread it, but yeah, that's, that's not the spreading I'm, looking at for but that preparation the nettle one i think is one of the most important because nettles is one of the only herbs that has all essential amino acids it has several non-essential it has calcium magnesium iron silica it's it's just a superfood dried it has more protein than meat like it's it's an amazing plant so of all the biodynamic preparations the only one that consistently improves flavor is the nettle preparation. It improves color, flavor, taste. And I consider that to be one of the best proofs of good food. So that one, I think there's no upper limit of how much to bring to your compost pile. And since it's the only one that doesn't require an animal sheath, it's a very safe one for people to 
start making now. Even if they can't source cow manure or horns, you can make nettle by burying that because it's just the plant. With all of these remedies, is the is the uh, the process something like you know you do this all every year, every year you're doing this, or are you sort of assessing the land to be more prescriptive about how you are using these things? I think a lot of us do it automatically. We're either buying the preparations in, and there's nothing wrong with that, or we're making them whether or not the farm needs it. But I think your suggestion is correct. I think it should be done more prescriptively on, on a needs basis. But given the subtlety of what these things are and how little plants need of each each season, it's, really, it's hard to overdo it because it's not like, if I apply too much copper to my field, I can poison my plants. But if I apply a little too much of these preparations, the plants only ask for these things when they need them. So that's the big difference. You're not drowning them in a, a super saturation of nutrients, but you're putting enough there so that if the plant wants it, it can go send a request, send a request, and then it has what it needs. Given the range of these herbs that are selected, I, I almost like to think of it as we're, we're putting into the compost pile things that almost never get put in there. Who puts flowers? in their compost pile, like like prime medicinal herb grade flowers into their compost pile. We tend to put manure, leafy things, weeds that have gone to seed. Um, we're not usually giving the compost something of that aromatic oil or the medicinal flower part of things. So that's part of this process for me is taking from that metabolic floral side and bringing that down into the compost pile to basically radiate it with that influence because there's a tendency for it to fall on the other side of the browns and the greens, but where is the aromatic floral elements? So for me, if we were to treat the compost pile as if the compost pile were a person and it needs the same medicinal herbs that I do, well, then when you take that compost and feed it to your lettuce, to your tomatoes, well, then you're actually moving into the world where food becomes medicine because you treated the compost pile with the herbs you need. Well, then all of the plants you start eating are in themselves already a homeopathic remedy of that. Do you think that these remedies have non-local effects? In other words, um, you know, you may put them in your land where you are right now. I don't actually know where you are right now, but is it having broader effects geographically uh what's your sense of this well i think it has an effect in a very distinct way so imagine just think in terms of microbes or in terms of wildlife when we have a lot of wildlife habitat the, that habitat doesn't limited to my farm so when I host butterflies and insects and migratory birds, they don't stay here. In fact, they they proliferate and they go to the neighboring property and the neighboring property becomes more biodiverse because mine is. And I think it's very much the same way as when we provide prebiotics throughout the farm. So there's food for microbes. The microbes don't just stay here. They also move over there when a bird takes something and drop some manure on the neighboring field or when a plant grows in a seed broadcast it has a radiant effect and it is isn't limited to where i sprayed it but it has this organic life because anything that's alive it proliferates it spreads and in a good way so no i i completely agree i i don't think it's limited just to where we apply it and year after year it becomes a radiant center almost a like a star shining. There, there are certain minerals that are high, very necessary uh, for human health. Uh, yeah. You know, just more on a more on a material level. You know, uh, that are not. You know, you hear quite a bit about they're not in the soil, so they're not getting into the body. Things like uh, copper or magnesium yeah. or maybe boron. Um, are they, you know, aside from the remedies, are there things that you 
add to the soil, like minerals that are that you add to the soil in addition to these remedies? Sure. Um, well, one thing Steiner says is that a lot of trace minerals, the rain and air bring, but he says certain things nature does not do for you. For example, if you want to balance pH, you have to do that yourself. Like that's, you're going to have to have some sort of lime, whether it's wood ash or gypsum or something, you're going to have to balance your pH. That's nature. What doesn't do that for you. You're going to have to worry about phosphorus, whether it's literally the element or whether you're bringing in manures in order to supply that need and you're gonna to have to think in terms of potassium so those are ones that we have to manage and that includes the whole realm of mineral salts so one thing i've done and i find is useful and doesn't seem to overwhelm anything is applying about a 50 pound bag of sea salt breaker um, gives the full spectrum of all 19 non-radioactive elements and yeah, it's dilute enough that I'm not I'm not force feeding any of the plants, but it's enough to really stimulate what what they need. So that's one thing that I use. I use gypsum as well. And I but I've been weaning myself away from a lot of inputs. The more that I use truly vitalized compost and I put what I think I need in that, including, for example, like copper. I don't add copper to my compost, but I make special remedies out of, say, plantain, because that is one of the most, the richest sources of copper on the farm in terms of weeds. So I make a point of adding an abundance of that to my compost pile, knowing that I already have bioavailable copper, I'm not going to overdo it, and I just keep cycling back the most prevalent weeds, especially ones that I know to be hyper accumulators of particular elements. So that's how I approach those. It, it's become less and less about getting the right mineral balance and more about the right vitality of the compost that I have. And that process is a process of quality assessment. And how, how do you do that? Well, you can do plant trials, you can do controls, and then there's the form of chromatography in biodynamics where we take soil samples and basically develop photographs out of what's happening behind the scenes. And then we analyze the quality of the picture, how much how warmth it has, the diversity of peaks. And we can learn from a picture how much humus there is, the microbiological diversity, the enzymatic diversity, and maybe what that soil needs from us. So we try to shift into that without denying the reality of the world of numbers and move into the world of almost aesthetics, where I can look at a picture and it can evoke a feeling and I know what to do about that. It's so cool. I mean, what you're describing is, um, is you know, it's like botanical laboratory that um, yep. you're, it, that's, that is living dynamic, that is, that you're, you're constantly adjusting and adapting to what, what's going on um, year to year or maybe season to season. Yep. It's pretty cool what you're what you're up to. I think so. <laughs> uh, well, geez, thank you. Um, how do folks get more information about you? And what you're what you're up to? Sure. Um, if people want to go visit the Josephine Porter Institute, that's jpibiodynamics.org. Um, I can also be reached through there. We're now on Substack, where our I think it's been out for almost 30 years, but where Applied Biodynamics, our periodical, is now migrating to the digital world. And we, yeah, we send stuff out to people around the world, but I'm trying to keep up with a steady pace of new articles on both the esoteric and highly practical experimental side of biodynamics, because it's not just one or the other. It's easy to drift into the clouds, but I'm also a farmer, so that keeps me more grounded than i I think otherwise would be. If I weren't a farmer, I'd just float up into the ideas. But as it is, I have to make a living by growing something out of the dirt. And that's good for me. But the Josephine Porter Institute and yeah, happy to answer any questions anybody might have.